Does anyone know about things such as smart goals? Being some nods in the back of the room. You've heard this before. Let's touch on it. SMART, S-M-A-R-T, is an acronym. And it reminds us that if we want to be better goal setters, the goals we set should have certain features or characteristics. And these characteristics are reminded to us by the letters S-M-A-R-T. So those of you that are familiar with this, what does S stand for? Specific. Specific. Good. Now that I know that this, some of this is review, I won't belabor some of the things I might have. We'll move along quickly. When you're sitting with your board or your committee, you'll want to, and you start talking about what's our objective for 2017, saying, hey, we want to celebrate our millennial. That's not a goal, right? In fact, let's, let's think about this. Celebrate a millennial. Celebrate millennial. That is not a specific goal. If it's not specific, you don't know if you've accomplished it or not. What's the next letter stand for? Measurable. Measurable. Great. So ideally, and I'm not a massive fan of math, but one of the great things of math is that it becomes much more objective of whether or not you've accomplished something. So for example, Celebrating the millennial might be measurable. We want to have a minimum of 500 people come to celebration. Something that you can actually count and see if you got it right or not. So specific might be throw a great big party. Measurable might be have 500 people attend. A. What does A stand for? Yeah, there's two variations of this. I'm going to choose for A, action orientated and for R, realistic. It doesn't really matter. This is not, I'm not the kind of teacher who thinks that there's something that's, that's you know, we're going to pour cement here and that's the way it's got to be. This is a guideline. It's, it's, it's a skill development. So let's call A action orientated. This is a reminder to the goal setter that they should be thinking about the goal in terms of things that you need to do. It's your input. In financial services, one of the things we talk about in helping people become more successful is we say things like, listen, don't try to manage the output. You, you know, if you, if you want to have 10 new clients next year, what you need to do is say, how many people do I need to talk to to get 10 new clients? Focus on the thing you can do, the actions that you can actually take. So celebrating a millennial might be action oriented. We are going to host a party and invite 1,000 people so that 500 people come out to attend our party. As an example, R, based upon mine, we're going to call R realistic. Now, realistic is a tricky word. When we get started as goal setters, or as committees, or boards, and we start setting goals, <clears throat> we want something that's achievable, but also something that's a bit of a push, right? The implication of the word success is that we're moving from a state of a, a current state of affairs to some new state of affairs, yes? To know if we've done that, we need to know what our current state of affairs are. So part of setting goals would be to say, okay, for example, in the case of the celebrating the millennial, you might say, every time we throw a party, we get 50 people. It's got to be at least twice as good as that. This is a big deal. But to know that it's an accomplishment, to know that what the realistic goal should be, it's really helpful if we get a sense of what we're currently doing. <laughs> so for example, and we're going to talk about this a lot more as we go forward, in Calgary, what we wanted to do was capitalize on this beautiful new temple that we had just re redone, rebuilt in the inner city of Calgary. Inner city of Calgary is this dynamic changing place. Uh, as the life cycle of many cities are, people start in the city, they start moving out to the suburbs, there's a bit of a, um, a, a degradation or, or the inner city's communities become uh, less desirable, 
And then at some point, the people go, I don't want to live way out here anymore. And they start going back to the inner city and they start developing out again. This is where Calgary is at in their lifestyle. So people start to come back in, redevelop that. New people were coming, immigrants were coming, young professionals were coming. And we wanted to be able to say to these people, come on in and check out the temple. For us to know if we're successful in getting new people to come at least step inside the temple, if that, and that wasn't one of our goals, is we want to get foot traffic. We want to get people in there checking it out. We needed to know how many people were coming in so we could measure what our success is. So part of the goal setting, the realistic, is having a good look at what your current state of affairs are so that when you're setting your next set of goals, you're comparing it to that. For many organizations, when they first start taking this stuff seriously, they don't know the answer to some of their measurables. They just don't know. Um, for example, you may not know how many people come into your temple that are not members from year to year. You won't know if you've done an increase or a decrease. Uh, the things you probably are aware of is the revenue you bring in, because usually treasurers are pretty good at letting us know what that looks like and keeping us on track with our budgets. They've been measuring that, but some of the other things are not measuring very well. What is the T in SMART? Great. So, when we're saying we're going to celebrate a millennial and we're going to have a big party, 500 people are going to come, so we've got to invite at least 1,000 people, and that's a pretty good increase over what we've done before and realistic and achievable because we know how to get in front of 1,000 people, and we need to do all of that by the date of the celebration, you know, a year and a half out. Um, saying we're going to get new members or just to have a celebration without a time frame on it is not very useful needs to be time bound. If for no other reason it keeps everybody committed to a plan and to a process. So, if we stopped today, at this moment, and you went back to your temples, what I would want you to be able to do is to say, first of all, we want to be successful at something, which means we better start setting goals, and we better start writing these down, thinking about it, and getting better at this. What's something else that helps us set and accomplish our goals? I think sharing them less. So when we talk about communication strategy and various purposes and objectives a little later on this morning, one of the things I want you to think about is it's not enough that our board or our committees are setting goals we need to be seen as setting goals. They should be understood by the congregation at large and saying them. If it means that non-Buddhist participants should be aware of our goals, such as the media and so on, which we'll talk about, we should be aware that we need to share these. One of the um, axioms, if you will, or one of the principles of financial services industry that I had to get uh, very good with when I was running large organizations, I was in the role of the chief compliance officer, which means, let's say you've all invested money at some point in your life, a system is built so that you are treated properly, so that you understand in theory what you're buying, the things, the investments you're buying are supposed to make sense for you given your risk tolerance and your comfort and so on. All of those systems are built by chief compliance officers and compliance people. So the securities regulators say, here's the broad principles of what you're supposed to do, Here's when you're breaking the law. Now go build systems within those companies to protect and inform consumers. So for us, we're, I was building these systems. And one of the principles was, and this is relevant for today, it's not enough that we be seen as doing the right thing. Sorry, it's not enough that we actually do the right thing. We must be seen as doing the right thing. That means that goal setting is more than just an internal function. It's, a it's part of the communication strategy. It should be seen that we're setting goals. Those goals should be known. Now, let's continue with the success theory a little bit. I believe that we can increase the likelihood of being successful, that is, the likelihood of setting and accomplishing our goals, if we do more than set SMART goals. I believe we can dramatically increase the likelihood of success if we recognize that there is a difference between certain types of goals that we set. 
And we're talking about two of these today because they're the most important for these purposes. Two types of goals that we can set are competitive goals and positive goals. Competitive goals are the goals that we set that require another party to fail in their goal. I know it's funny. No, it's not funny. It requi our success requires somebody else to be unsuccessful. And these goals happen all the time. Let's pick one. A road race. Running. A marathon. A one mile race. Anyone run in here? Anyone run races anymore? Do you? <laughs> in a race, how many people get to win? <laughs> That's only one. You know, I'm not a big fan. One of the, I, I think sports are important I, I, in the sense that, you know, they can be good for teamwork and personal health and so on. But sometimes this, the sports and the Olympics and stuff gets very extreme. It starts really just acknowledging a couple of people and saying these are the successful people because they got a gold medal and, and everybody else is not worth thinking or talking about. You know, and this is a competitive goal environment. The, the gold medal winner only gets to accomplish that goal if everybody else in that event fails and I'm trying to get their goal. And the implication being is that if we set competitive goals, if that's the focus of our attention as a business organization, as a not-for-profit, as a church, or as a professional in any way, if that's our focus, what will happen is we'll always be in environments where there's way more failure than success. Way more failure than success. And something interesting happens in those environments call them competitive goal environments. Relationships are formed. I'm a big relationship guy. I, uh, the, the speaking that I did in the United States around books like uh, my current book, which is more awesome client events, is really talking about how businesses and professionals can build relationships and why it's so important when products and services are all the same, generic, that we have a strategy that, that actually reconnects with people. Relationships are so important to me. Even more important, we have some younger people in the room that have grown up with social media, technology, the internet, that perhaps because they don't know other ways of building relationships, think that that's how you build relationships. And there are certain skills that are being lost. The next generation is, is going to have to get reskilled on some of the things that the previous generation gets about interpersonal connections. I really believe that. Um, there was a, a woman in the 1980s named Faith Popcorn who wrote a book. It was called The Popcorn Report or something. But she was talking about trends over the next 20 and 30 years. And I'm not saying she was that smart or anything, but one of the trends in the book she identified was she said that in 20 or 30 years, the predominance of people that, that are shy, that have trouble connecting with people one-on-one, -on -one, uh, is going to skyrocket. And there may be things like shyness consultants or people that are helping those people get better in interpersonal relationships. And I'm not saying that that's exactly where we're at today, but you start hearing about things such as various um, ranges of Asperger's. And you know, my, my daughter is a university student, and she's sometimes very good with people, and other times just needs to disconnect from people completely. It's just, it just gets overwhelming, that interpersonal stuff for her. And um, I'm sympathetic, obviously, but this idea that that we've got to connect with people and build relationships is massive for me. If we're only setting competitive goals, not that you would, but if that's the focus, the relationships that arise are competitive relationships. They're competitive. Do they want you to succeed? No, because if you succeed, what happens to them? They lose. So it's not, it's not that they're even neutral. They, they're going to undermine you, you know, if, if, if you say we're going to be the biggest temple in, 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 you know, Hawaii. Well, if you're going to be the biggest, now you're even just, the way you're articulating your language is setting yourself up to make somebody else less than you are. And then what happens is instead of collaborating, you're competing. And that is, it's not that we never want to do that. But I'm saying if that is the focus of goal setting, a church, and a person, of an organization, of a business, you're going to have some problems. You know, if you say, I want to be the, the most successful realtor on Hawaiian Islands as measured by the number of houses I sell, and somebody else does one more than me, and then all of a sudden, I, you know, my team thinks you know, we're a failure, what, what was the point of that? That's not a very useful exercise. Competitive goals, competitive relationships. Let's talk about now what is easy to understand the opposite. 
positive goals. These are the goals that we set that are such that if we're successful, it means that somebody else is also successful. Somebody else is also successful. Ah, lawyers, accountants, realtors, let's hope. Let's hope in their mind they go, hey, you know, June, I'll make lots of money if you save lots of taxes. June's going, okay. Hey, June, I'm going to make more money as an investment advisor if you make more money as an investor. And June's going, all right. You know, we're on the same page. <laughs> they said, our interests are aligned, right? And so in a positive goal environment, we can all win. Everybody can win. Because everyone's looking for slightly different outcomes, but our, sex, our successes are interconnected. We're stakeholders in each other's success. I love that. Because the positive relationships that arise in those environments become one of the most important things to think about. So when I was teaching these classes at some big banks and financial planning companies in Canada, talking to these very smart investment advisors and bankers in the room, I'd say, so talk to me about your relationship building strategy. No, they talk about what's going on in the market, and they think you know a change in currency might mean for Canadians it's a big thing. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. It's terrible. I can't buy anything here. Everything's fifty percent more expensive than my three year old. I was saying, should we go to that timeshare presentation? No, no timeshare presentation for us. Not this year. Positive relationships mean that we can all share in each other's success, and they become some of the most important things we can do. So when I was really getting better in the financial services business and starting to, to be successful in, in my definition of success, accomplishing my goals, I stopped focusing on things like the number of new clients or the amount of money I, I got invested in or the rate of return. I started focusing on relationships. How many new relationships am I starting? What's the quality of the relationship? What does that mean? If we have the strong relationships and we focus on those, the goals we set are more likely to be achieved. So, when we're thinking about success, and you should be, you think, I'm going to get better at goal setting, I'm going to add features to these goals like specific and measurable, action oriented, realistic and time bound, and so on. I'm going to think about these goals in terms of how can other people win from my goals? How do other people win from my goals? When we start talking about communication strategy, and we start talking about the message and the purpose, which is where all this is going to, I'm doing the preparation work now. Where we're going to is saying, I've got to think about these messages in terms of the audience going, oh, I get what's in it for me. And we should care about that because we should be trying to focus on relationships that are positive, that means we're both sharing in our successes. We're both getting what we want out of this. Anyone familiar with Stephen Covey? Seven Habits. What is, how does Stephen Covey put these same points? Do you recall from the book? Think, win, win. That's his expression. Good, I mean, that's why he's so famous and I'm not. He says in a few words, but it's taking me half an hour to tell you. <laughs> Philosophy major, we get paid per word. We're like lawyers that way, right? I know. So, we want to go back and get better at being successful. Setting goals, thinking about what's in it for the other parties. Next. Trust. This is where you're going to go, oh yeah, Rod has a philosophy degree. Uh-oh. We're in trouble now. If we're setting goals that include other people, that require other people to do what we want them to do, like attend a celebration, <clears throat> getting people to do things means there's a, a precondition to that. It's what we're discussing in the financial services industry throughout North America now, is concerns that consumers are losing trust in financial advisors because they may not have the client's interests apart, they may be more interested in their commission and stuff like that. Discussions about whether or not they should eliminate commission, you know, add more rules. All of that stuff is about this. This concern in the financial services industry that consumers are losing trust in the entire industry. It is, in fact, one of the reasons why we're having this phenomenon that's being called a robo-advisor. You're seeing that in the United States, big brands saying, you know what? 
Millennials, you people that are, by the way, depending on what you what, what I read, I'm either a baby boomer or a millennial. I was born in 64. So some of the books I read say 64 is a baby boomer. Some say 64 is a millennial. I'm not sure. Again, like Brillo and countries, I don't fit in anywhere <laughs> kind of out there. Is that, that millennial group, of which there are definitely millennials in this room, they're saying, you know what, you guys aren't going to trust some of the old ways of getting this information. We're going to create apps. They're going to be on your iPads. And you know what, because you trust a system more than you trust a person, because the system doesn't get paid a commission. They don't have conflicts of interest. Right? What am I paying for? I can't trust them. Might as well just go on my app and stick 10 grand into some ETFs, right? I don't want you to think this is all about financial <laughs> services. But the premise is being, if we want to engage people and fulfill those positive relationships, we need to understand this. So one of the reasons I teach ethics classes for business owners is a lot of people don't really understand what this is all about. You need to understand that if you're going to connect with your audiences out there, there needs to be a level of this. So does anyone here have a working definition of trust? Questions, aren't they? I am. Very abstract concepts. Roger, Roger, I say I trust you. Confidence that you will do what you say. Great. You guys are such a small <laughs> Really good. I love the word confidence. <coughs> How do you spell it? <laughs> Z. <laughs> confidence. And I'm going to tell you. But I think trust has two states of confidence it's described. And I think Roger hit one on the head is, I trust you will do what you say. I trust you do the right thing. Do right thing. Logically, that implies something. Can anyone figure it out? We're going to talk about that. That's important. No? Doing the right thing means you're honest? How about that you can do it? Okay? So I'm going to suggest to you that trust has two, represents two states of confidence that you can do what you say you're going to do and you will choose to do that. Can do, will do. How about that? So it's kind of like a mental exercise that I'd like you to think about now. We've got Roger who's a taller guy. He's a shorter guy. Linda, right? Linda refuses Linda wrote her name on her name tags, this woman here, this big. And then she put it under her sweater. <laughs> this is a challenge to a guy like this. I gotta know who this person is and why she doesn't want me to know her name. <laughs> Linda's tiny, Roger's a little bit taller. So let's say that, that they're gonna stand up and and Roger's going to catch Linda and Linda's gonna fall back. Now, we think that Roger probably can do it. He's got the physical strength. We should be wondering about, does he have the moral disposition to do it? <laughs> yeah. Or is he all about some cheap laughs? <laughs>, laughs? Might be. Now let's reverse this a little bit. Linda's going to go, no, Roger's going to go back and Linda's going to catch him. Well, Linda seems like a really upstanding person of integrity. And what we'd be worrying about is, could she catch him? Right? Does she have the physical ability to answer, is he going to go, you know, and will she also get some cheap laughs like I'm trying to do now? So trust is confident we'll do the right thing and that we're actually able to do it. And we talk about trust in, then in two variations or versions. What we're going to call integrity trust and ability trust. Integrity trust and ability trust. If you are going to go forward to your communities because you are driven by some goals that are well thought out and, you know, are win-win goals, other people are going to benefit from your efforts and all that stuff, and now you're wanting to get stuff done and you want to engage people around you to help and get the community involved, they've got to trust you. They've got to trust, if you say to the media, show up at our millennial celebration, it's going to rock it, you know, and it's going to be front page news because it's such a cool thing going on, They've got to trust that you can do this. Because they don't want to send a bunch of cameras and all that stuff to go, what's this, you guys got 10 people here? It's not a celebration. So that's an easy example. But they've got to believe that you can do these things that you say you're going to do to get behind you. 
And then they've got to believe that you actually have the nerve, the fortitude, the integrity to see that through to its completion. I know you guys can do this, this party thing, because what? There's a thousand of you. Surely, you know, you can coerce 500 people to come out. But you know what? You guys are, the Buddhists don't do what they say they're going to do. They never, they never kind of, you know, they do a lot. I'm not saying that that's true. But what we don't want anyone to say is that, yeah, actually, they don't, they don't actually, there's no follow through there from those organizations. What a chat. You know, I could have come out here and Piper, Piper might have said to me, hey, we're going to have 20, 30, 40 people, carve a day out of your holiday, it'll be fun. And if I would have shown up, and I might have said, you know what, I think Piper, you know, he, maybe he has the ability, there's probably 40 people on the island who <coughs> want to hear this, but maybe Piper doesn't, he just doesn't see things through. Maybe I shouldn't trust that he's actually, you know, going to follow this through. And look, he blew my socks off. Well, so what are you? I'm wearing socks. He did it. And so, by like going forward, I'm going to say, well, Piper has both the ability to fill a room and the, and the disposition, the, the nerve and the fortitude to make sure it gets done. If he says to me, hey, Ron, why don't you come out? We're going to do a workshop again in a couple of years. Can you do a different topic or do a reminder or something like that? I'm going to say, you know what? Yeah, you know, Piper's a guy I can count on. I can trust Piper. I'm going to get in behind this activity. Up front, it's a leap of faith, isn't it? Conversely, Piper had to have a leap of faith for me. He's going, who's this rod guy? Does he know anything about Buddhism? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> I might, Linda. I might know a few things about Buddhism. I knew there would be fruit here today. <laughs> That's something. <laughs> I have my banana. I brought it. I guess my bed a little bit. But so, you know, conversely, Piper says, you know, do I trust that Rod's going to do a good job? Or is he going to embarrass me in front of everybody such that next time I say, hey, you guys, we should get together and do a board workshop. You're going, I don't know, Piper, that last guy you brought was a <laughs> <laughs> big leap of faith, right? So I'm making a point. I'm not just trying to entertain, although I have a plan doing that. When we're establishing trust, that is also part of communication strategy. This is one of the reasons why, when I was reflecting upon why is it that my financial services business was being successful, even though I did not have the same technical skills as my peers, is because I established trust with the market. I figured out the difference between ability trust and integrity trust, and I could focus on it. I could communicate about it. So, for example, when Piper was vetting me, and he wants to see, does Rod have these abilities? He was able to see that I had been at the world... Buddhist Conference, the World's Women's Buddhist Conference. Uh, there's a video of me online. You'll see where I'm going with this. You can look at my website and see me being reported about in various newspapers in Canada, pieces of me on the radio or on television and stuff. And he might go, gee, you know, all things considered, it looks like Ross done a lot of this. He probably has the ability. He probably has the ability. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, gonna to feel confidence in that. I'm going to trust that he can do it. And then what he had to figure out is, is he likely to do it? Now what he might have done, and we've never discussed this, but he might have said, you know, he's president of Calgary Buddhist Temple. Nobody does that unless their heart's in it. Nobody, that's a thankless job. You all know that. <laughs> we volunteer our time. We'll do 90, it's like marriage. I will do 99 things right and one thing wrong. And what does she talk about, Linda? Nothing right and wrong. Are you married? That you one day you'll know this. <laughs> Get an extra pad of paper for this. <laughs> Some guy, somebody else would be very happy to learn this. So it's Piper. Piper probably said, you know, he's he's on the board. He, he his heart is probably into this. He's got nothing else to do in Hawaii. Saturday morning, he's probably going to come up prepared and you know and, and really try. His heart's probably. I'm going to trust that he will do what he says he can do. We had to communicate about that. He might not have known that I had been thinking about these things and that I had pieces out there designed to help him have those states of confidence in me. Because I think about this stuff. He might have got brought into my, my system of communication and concluded what I wanted him to conclude. I don't mean I manipulated him. I mean, I'm worthy of the trust. I am worthy of it. The challenge I had was to communicate in a way that he'd go, he is worthy of this trust that I'm about to impart on him. You have the same challenge. You have the same challenge. One of the things you'll want to do when you sit down with your board or your committee 
you know, and, and maybe you'll have trouble articulating some of this stuff or, or presenting a case for it. Maybe I'm, I might do a better job than you will when you go back. But at least you'll want to go, how do we establish ability trust with our community? With our, and by community, I mean Sangha and, you know, the general community. How do we establish integrity trust? What does that look like? And actually writing it down. Good. Trust. We knew a little bit more about that. When we say, I love being, I love doing philosophy, it's great. When we say, I trust somebody, and, and you're saying, I trust, I have integrity trust, I trust you will do the right thing, what is really going on there? How many people drove here today? When you drove here, did you legitimately think at some point I should be very worried that someone is going to drive your car into my car? Were you generally worried about that? Not enough to not drive. So why, why are we not worried about that when we do that activity? Past experience. Past experience? Okay. It's reasonable thing, more or less, the future will be like the past. What else do we have to go on, right? Piper going, hey, I think Rod can probably do this because he's done it before. It's reasonable to conclude that he can do it again, so I get that. Here's what I think is going on. I think that when we're driving our car, we need to assume the people around us have the same values as us. That they value their physical health, maybe the health of their passengers, the way that we value our physical health and the health of the people in the car with us, and probably value the car itself. Don't want to damage my car. Anybody here ever park into a parking lot and, and see some spots and, and say, oh, that beat up car, I'm not going to park by the, the beat up car. <laughs> I'm going to park by Liz's Mercedes. <laughs> Why? Because Linda is not going to open up that door and hit my car. She values that car so much, right? So we have something, with what I'm talking about, or getting close to talking about a concept called the social contract. You'll see where I'm going with this. I make points with everything. Social contract is basically this idea that for all of us to come together in society and kind of function, we have to kind of make some assumptions about each other. And unless they ruin those assumptions, you know, so that history and the future, you know, hey, they're, they seem to be doing okay, driven down the, you know, whatever the highway is, the main one. Hey, what's that one called? H1. I've driven the H1 before. No one's tried specifically to run into me. It's, I'm comfortable more than that. Why did they not do it in the past? It's probably because we're sharing the same values. Social contract. We have to assume a certain set of uh, reasonable values we're sharing. Does it always work that way? Last year, some people got into a plane in Spain. Pilot drove into the mountains intentionally, apparently. The pilot did not value their physical well being the way that the passengers did. did they? No. Does that mean it was unreasonable for them to assume it? No, we can't function if we don't do that. But what happened is the values didn't work that way. When we trust somebody, for that to function, especially if we don't know them that well, we're engaging with them the first time. There has to be a sense that we must be sharing the same values to a certain extent so that when I think they're going to do the right thing, it's also what I think the right thing is. You follow me? I'll give you a different kind of example. My wife and I were watching on Netflix a couple weeks ago. It was a movie um, uh, biography kind of piece about a corrupt policeman in, in Brooklyn. Well, it was okay. It was a, I wouldn't recommend it. Necessarily. But it's not bad. And, and, but there's a really interesting scene in this where the, the policeman is early in his uh, career as being a corrupt cop, and he's got a new partner, and they're the first ones on the, or they're on the scene of a, uh, of a something bad happening in an apartment, and some other cops take away the bad guys, and now they're in the room there, and they start searching the room, and they come across big bags of cash. Nobody knows about this, except for the bad guys. Bad guys aren't going to say anything because it'll help, you know, make them go to jail. So the one cop, the real bad cop says in the movie, he says, I looked at the other guy, I looked at Roger, and I knew I could trust him. What did he mean in that context? I knew I could trust that if I took all this cash and we decided to split it, that we'd be on the same page together. 
And that is how their career together as corrupt cops started. They made a lot of money. I knew I could trust him. Does that mean he's a good guy? No, no, when he says, I knew I could trust him, he's, I knew we shared the same values. That's what that means. I will sing if you keep that up, I promise. <laughs> trust means, I've got to kind of assume that the other people have the same values that I have for this to work. Or, to say I trust you is meaning our values are aligned. Our values are aligned. What's the implication of this? When I work with businesses, accountants, lawyers, financial advisors, one of the first things I talk to them about is a value statement. Not just a mission statement, a value statement. Why? Because if they want people to trust them, integrity, integrity trust, it means they need to get a sense of what your values are to see if they align with their values so that if they think he's going to do the right thing, what he thinks is the right thing is the same thing as what I think is the right thing. That's what that means. It is also one of the reasons why we have problems in the world between cultures being unhappy with other cultures, in part because what one group of people think is right is not necessarily the same with what another people. And it doesn't mean that they're both right. I'm not going into that liberal discussion. What I do want to say is that when we trust somebody, it is about saying, I think they have the same values that I do, so they're going to do the right thing, because that's what I would do, and he's like me, or she's like me, so I'm going to do it. We want to establish trust with the market, with our congregation, with the community at large, integrity trust and ability trust, we should be thinking about, are we communicating our values? Are we communicating our values? It's not just should be, we must be. Unless somebody knows our values. What if there are people out there who don't know the values associated with Buddhism? Or your particular group, or your temple? We all, I shouldn't say we all, it's common practice for organizations such as the ones you represent to have a mission statement. Do you have a value statement? I'm not saying you must do this, but it is a topic you should be raising, and you should be saying to your, your fellow directors and committee members, hey, you know, long term, we want, we want the community to trust us, we've got to talk about our values to them so that we, they can see that we have the same values. Really important. Part of what we're going to be communicating. About. Any questions about that? Does anybody in here have a value statement? for their temple. Whereas the values, you know, it's a little complicated because the values are probably kind of connected up with Buddhist values at large, but are they ever expressed specifically? What's yours? You're expressing values in the mission statement? Roger, do you know your mission statement off the top of your head? I don't know mine, so I don't mean to put it on the spot. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, sometimes it gets complicated. We know we did it, but I can't remember exactly the words anymore. <laughs> But you know for sure that the values are, are kind of caught up in the mission statement. What's your, where's the Calvary? I don't remember off the top of my head. We just redid it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've got to be honest with you. I can make up stuff, and you wouldn't know. But I, 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 I want you to trust me, so I'm going to say I'm just prepared to tell you what I don't know. Is there a definition of vision and values? Because that word is here. You develop your common values, and you can actually develop your vision. Well, that's a really good question. What's the relationship between values, vision, and mission? You know, a lot of this is just playing, some of this stuff is playing with words, and consultants like to make distinctions up that maybe don't exist or do exist. But I personally think it starts with values. Values drive the actions that we perform, and the reason why anyone would be thinking of vision or a mission is that they think it's important to do that. So their values are saying, hey, you should spend some time on those things. The vision would be about where, where we want to be in broad brushstrokes. What's our overarching objective here? To promote Jodo Shinsho Buddhism might be an expression we, we could see us. That's our, our overarching mission. Our vision would be our, our vision of what we, we want to see. You know, so the vision would be like to see, I would like to see our Jodo Shinsho temple as, a, as prominent in our community. That, we, we have those words in Calgary. I'm going to take a couple of steps back because where we arrived today was not a foregone conclusion in Calgary. Not a foregone conclusion. 
The Calvary Buddhist Temple, the original, originally was a Catholic church. I don't know if you know the history. It was well over 100. In fact, thank you for laughing. One of the reasons why I like Buddhism, I wanted to, in this Catholic, this old world Catholic church, and there were stained glass windows up there with a cross in it still. And I said to Sensei James, you know, this is one of the reasons why I was, was drawn. You, I'm drawn to Buddhism for intellectual reasons. I'm drawn to a Buddhist community because of the people. My sensei helped draw me in. And I said, how, how can we have stained glass you know, crosses up there? He goes, well, it used to be a Catholic church, and we're hedging our bets here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> church that had sat up on the hill someplace that was at the time the edge of the city. And then the, the, the reason that it was originally built was because they thought the city was going to expand. There was some like, First World War or something started and, and it didn't expand so nobody was coming up there. So they, the Catholics lifted up the church. They brought it down this big hill across the river from downtown Calgary to now what's inner city. It would be like being down in Waikiki. It's, it's like right there close to the downtown. And, and so it was this old building. Now, when I first started as a, in a leadership capacity with the, with the temple, the board was telling me, you know, I think what we're going to do is sell this land and go build something on, you know, outside in the community. You can get a lot of land out the outskirts, right? Downtown's very expensive out there. You could do it. And I said to them, I said, if you're going to do that, I'm not helping. It's not my values. It's not my vision. I said, it doesn't mean you should change. You guys have whatever values and visions you want. It's nice that we're talking about it. Because now, I mean, by, by understanding what ultimately is important to the various parties, we can figure out if we should be working together, have a positive relationship, positive goals, and so on. I said, no, my values are inner city engaging communities of various ethnic and socioeconomic circumstances. My personal value, I don't own a car because I try to walk everywhere. Doesn't mean you should. It's not about you. That's my value. I said, I don't think that I should get, I want everyone to have to drive out there where there's no bus and stuff like that in the middle of winter in Calgary. You're crazy. It's not about These people are coming here, buildings are coming up, everyone's going to be able to walk. My values are, you know, stay downtown. Uh, my values are community. Not just the Buddhist community. We are part of a community, I told them. This is what I see. My Value is that it's important to be part of the community. Therefore, my vision was, I see, if you guys, if we share the same vision, I see a Buddhist temple that now is a focal point in the community. Not an old building that people go by and go, what's that? No, no, one, is, no one is even compelled to go into it. It was, it was pretty, pretty bad looking. The only reason someone might have come in if they went, oh, it's a Buddhist temple, I've never been into one. It doesn't even look like a Why would I go in? And maybe they would have. So my vision was, if, if you want to stay, we're, my overarching business is we're going to be a feature of the community. People are going to come there, even if, they're not, they, even if they don't self-identify as Buddhists, why would they not want to come in and use you know, these facilities? It's all in walking distance for someone. And, and a lot of, and, and there was other people on the board that shared that vision, obviously, which is why we stayed. We talked about what we wanted things to look like, you know, and, how, and then how are we going to get there? Because our mission of, of driving, uh, bringing Sharon Joe Shinsho cultures and traditions and some Japanese traditions and, and making this a place of, that people can you know, increase their happiness and reduce the suffering was all part of that. But we decided that the best way to do that was staying in the community because we thought that was important. So these are all connected and other groups might arrive at it differently. This is not super helpful maybe for you because most of you are not going, hey, we're going to pick up our temple and move to the other side of the island. You know, you can't do that in Hawaii. You can't just, in Calgary, we've got so much land in Canada, it's easy, we're relatively easy to do stuff. You don't have that opportunity. But maybe your vision or mission are about other things. You know, I'll give you an example, and this is only my sense of it, and maybe your, your environment here on the islands is different, but my sense here is that there is, uh, can be tension, I'm not saying is, can be tension between some who, who, whose values are that the Buddhist temple is really only about Buddhist things and certain traditions, and people whose values are, no, we can make this more about a, a place where the community become for various reasons. And one of the things you're going to 
grapple with, I'm imagining, because this is the discussion that's going on in Canada and all the other temples, is this sense of how we've done it and, and how we might want to do it. You know, the results we've had in the past and the results we're looking for. The expression that I know you know, because everybody uses this as a principle, is if we keep doing what we've always done, we're going to keep getting what we always got. <laughs> And, and then you say, well, I'm happy with what we've got. Well, then, why are we here? We, should, we don't need to set goals. Because remember, goals is about going from a state of affairs we are currently at to a new state of affairs. If we don't want to be in a new state of affairs because we're very happy with our current state of affairs, then I suppose you could say, well, our goal is to remain here. That's not really a goal. You know, status quo is not so much the goal when we're talking about goals and success. We're talking about moving towards something that we think is better. Is maybe because our values dictated, or the group has decided that's where we're going. Does that help to answer your question <coughs> about connecting these things up? Sometimes I take a long time to answer a question. You know why? To discourage questions. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. Not true. And you're a comedian. Ah, comedian. Do you know, I used to sit, thank you for that, I'm not a comedian. But I used to sit in so many classes, and I used to think to myself, you know, this person is knowledgeable, but this is really boring, and it doesn't need to be. Um, so hopefully, we're enjoying something here, getting something out of the concrete, but enjoying the journey as well together. So, trust. You've got to establish trust. It's about ability. We can do what we say. It's about integrity. We will actually do what we say. And it's about sharing values, because the audience needs to get a sense of what we think is important. That's got to be captured in all of that. Okay. Preparation. This is the, the last bit of the first section, which means we'll then do a little bit of work and take a break. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Not because I'm tired. I'm ready to go. Preparation. I've done enough of this to believe that this next set of discussion we're going to have after the break is going to be about change, at least thinking about it. One of the things we've learned at the Calgary Buddhist Temple in spades, and we're still learning, is being a guinea pig and going through some of what we're doing is, is making sure one's prepared for the kind of changes that they're contemplating. Here are some of the things that we thought about that I'm going to ask you to make some notes about the kinds of things that you might think you need to know. We had to decide if a non-member could get a key to the temple. We had to decide if someone coming into the temple needs to have separate insurance. How much does that cost? We had to decide if somebody within the temple was prepared to go over on Monday nights to let the yoga instructor in. And then Tuesday nights to let the yoga instructor in. I live a block and a half from the temple. Guess who went? <laughs> <laughs> I did yoga on Tuesday nights. If I'm going to go there, I've got to get something out of it. Preparation. Write down, take a moment, or discuss it if you're with anybody that you think you want to discuss this with. What are some of the things you think that you're going to have to go back and have conversations about? Do you have policies and procedures about renting the temple? Okay. Do you have processes in place for vetting potential parties that may want to come into the temple? Who does that? What's asked of them? Do some of the more traditional members of your group like these ideas. <laughs> One of the things, you know, might as well be candid, I may never ever see any of you ever again. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that was shared with, I'm here Italians, Italian family. I grew up with Italians in East Vancouver. That's kind of like the, you know, Bronx or something. It's the place where Italians grew up. And so I married, my wife was born in Italy, Italian. Very, very Italian. And I knew what I was getting into. The Italians, by culture, they're, they're, they're not shy. 
they're prepared to tell you what's on their mind, and if they don't like it, you know, and they're not necessarily subtle. You know, one of the hard things about Italians is there, you know, there's two ways of doing things their way and the wrong way, right? And it, well, it, so I used to say to my wife, and I said, listen to the, what they're saying. They're saying, oh, you're doing that? You can't do that. You're not supposed to do that. It's not, it's not that they, they, they will acknowledge you're doing something differently, and it's wrong. It's a different thing. But Italians are very upfront and clear about it. So somebody told me this about Japanese culture, and, and I don't know. I'm not, I'm not Japanese. One of the things I said when I, when I went on the president of the board at the Calvary Buddhist Temple, the outgoing president, uh, Les Nakuda, comes from a, a long line of senseis and a bishop and, and very well-known Japanese, very well-known in the community, and he gets, gets I said, Les, if I'm going to do this, you're going to stand beside me and, and help me interpret things that are going on in being <laughs> See, I can say this out loud. And so one of the things that I learned is they said, you know, Japanese sometimes, you're not really exactly sure, you know, it's, and it's kind of like they, there's a politeness that maybe, you know, afterwards, maybe not so much. And, which made, and I said, this is really useful for me because then, you know, if I'm trying to, you know, establish trust or, or you know, even having conversation, you know, sometimes I'm going, hey, we rent out our temple now, and, and someone will go, well, that's a really good idea. And now I go, do they really think that's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> See? You're, you all know this stuff. So I want you to know that I know. <laughs> newness and change and you know we've got some challenges and there's some things we need to work on I know part you're gonna go how's this gonna play you know you know they might say yes but they don't really like it you know stuff like that that is up to you to manage in your own environment <laughs> <laughs> it's your relationships it's your stuff however we, you still got to move in that direction which means preparation if we want to be in a different state of affairs than we are currently, and we've got goals around that, and we, we can demonstrate that we've got the fortitude and the ability to get there through trust, some of the basic preparation stuff needs to be done. <clears throat> Write down a couple of thoughts of preparation. I listed a few. Somebody in the room share with us a point of preparation that you think your temple might need to make to start moving towards change. And if you're shy about that, that's going to be very educational for me. What about a drop in membership and financial? Drop in membership and financial. What does that mean? Flesh that out for us. So your concern, your temple, is your membership is going down, and which means your um, revenues are less to help maintain your temple. Yeah. So what, what you're moving us towards is going to be the second part of this class when we're talking about specific objectives, specific messages, specific outcomes. And so what um, I'm going to pull us back because I like where you're going and we're going to get there, but we're kind of a step before that. What do we need to set up anything within our organization so that we can even talk about that? We're going to do drop-in. What do I need to prepare for that? Who's going to let the people in? Is there an alarm system? Do they need a code? Do they need insurance? Do they need a key? Do they have to sign a contract? Do they have to give us money in advance, a deposit? If not, do we, you know, how much do we charge them? Who gets to decide? Do we have a different rate for memberships versus non-memberships? Who gets to decide? So, what, now what we did in Calgary is we didn't, we weren't prepared. We, we knew that there was going to be a whole bunch of stuff that was coming up when we closed down the temple for these renovations, after we decided that we were going to stay, picture this. We do not have a temple to go do for service for it was a year and a half almost. Where would we go? We couldn't get in. It wasn't a little renovation. They tore it down. We called it a renovation because the only way we could get it approved to the city was calling it a renovation. <laughs> so yeah, we are a real smart bunch. You know exactly what I'm saying. So we, we said, if we call this a rebuild, it'll never, they'll never approve it. No, we'll have to have this, we'll have to have, we'll have to have parking. We didn't have parking, we're in the city. We're relying on the parking lot across the street. 
So what we had to do was demonstrate we were going to keep the same footprint, the same basic structure, and it was just a really, really, really long, expensive renovation. Now, actually, what happened is when we got into the teardown, we learned that there, we could see, I didn't personally see it, it was reported to me, that, that a fire had taken place up in the roof at some point in the last 125 years no one knew about. That the beams that we thought would keep the structure basically sound weren't structurally sound at all. They weren't even lined up. They had to rip down way more stuff. And they just kept ripping it down because once we got the approval to do a renovation through, we are like, well, what the heck, we've got to keep going. What's the city going to say? Stop? We knew we had a card we could play. This is my risk management thinking. I said, no matter who calls us and they ask us what we're doing, it's, we're saying it's for the safety of the members. It's always for the safety. Everything's for safety. Right? Everything's for safety. Don't worry about it. Because no one will argue against safety, right? You can't. So when the city started saying, well, wait a second, you know, everything's down, he said, well, you know, the roof wouldn't have been safe. Can't have not a safe roof. That's not going to be on me, that's going to be on you, right? So everything's going to be safe. So shoot that stuff. But what happened is we had a year and a half where, where we were busy with the World Conference, we were trying to find places to hold service that wasn't there, people were dispersing. A lot of anxiety. You can imagine that, that there are people going, what if never ever comes back? If you have a restaurant and you close for a year and a half, <laughs> you're going to go eat someplace else, right? So we weren't sure where, where it was all going to be. And by the time the temple was finally able to receive us, as well as our plans for engaging the community, that vision we had, engaged, we were just like, okay, let's just get started. Because... The, the temple opening was in August, and I knew that a lot of the classes and programs start in September. I don't know if it's the same way here in Hawaii, but people time up with the, the school year, and the, you know everyone takes a break in July and August, and say, okay, we're back in our classes in September. I figured we'd get a flurry of, of inquiries, and we did. So it was trial by fire. We just started saying, okay, come on, let's get renters, and we're gonna, we figure it out as we went along. Lots of debate. Some of it was really heated amongst the board. Not smooth. <laughs> Won't be, change isn't always easy. But what's happening is the results are really, really proving themselves out. But preparing those things that you need to prepare. Any suggestions about the kinds of things you think you might have to work on back? Just even get ready to do this. Look at your bylaws. Bylaws. Look at identify issues. Yep. Part of preparing is recognizing when what we're going to need to be communicating about the communication strategy. 